War. Uh. Good God, that was close. What is it? Now listen. What you know about war? Has been a part of human society since the fall of man. As soon as Adam and Eve fell, we get a history of war. All right. Now. I want you, I'm going to put you in a hypothetical situation for a minute, all right? I want you to imagine that you, um, that you're in an army and your general has been informed that no matter what happens during the war, no matter what happens during the battle, your side wins. So, you run out to battle, you die, it doesn't matter because you'll win in the end and everybody that dies comes back to life. Okay, you get a leg blown off, that's okay. Your leg can get blown off because when the battle's over with and your and your side wins, you get a new leg. Like not 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 a prosthetic, a brand new leg. So no matter what happens, you win. Alright? Um, there's a movie where Tom Cruise dies and restarts his day over and over and over again. Day after tomorrow. No, edge of tomorrow. Edge after tomorrow's day. And he he runs, he dies, and he starts over. All right? You can get your leg blown off. You can get your head blown off. You can get a hole shot right through your body by a missile. It doesn't matter because your team wins, and in the end, everybody that's dead comes back to life, and everybody that's injured gets healed. How do you think that would change the side that knows they're going to win in the way they fight? Now, I don't know about you guys. Listen, look at me. I'm a lover, not a fighter. I'm not a tough guy. All right? I, I've been in one fight, fifth grade. I did win. Let me, let me tell you how it went down. Here's how it went down. Dude named Michael Jenkins. Since then, he's changed his name to Dallas. I don't know why. Now his name is Dallas Jenkins. I have no clue why. His name's Michael Jenkins. Went to school with him. In fifth grade, he made fun of my sister. I said, hey, man. Hey, don't make fun of my sister. I'm the only one that can make fun of my sister. That's how brothers are, right? Hey, hey man. Don't, don't, don't make fun of my sister. And he said, what are you going to do about it? I said, man, I don't want to do anything about it. I just want you to leave my sister alone. He, he had one of those big plastic wiffle ball bats oh, no. that was, but you know it's kind of like skinny and it's really fat in the end? Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. yeah. He swung it at me. Oh, did you dodge? Oh, no, I dodged it. Oh, oh, like Neo style. I was like, oh, oh, I dodged it. I dodged it. Got the bat. Hit it over my knee. Yeah. Yeah. Punched it right in the face. Oh, I am not, listen, I am not here to promote violence. Are you sure? I should have probably hit him with the bat. That would have been better. I didn't think about that. This, this is proof that I'm a lover, not a fighter. The smart thing would have been take the bat and hit him on top of the head with it. I didn't want to hurt him that bad. He was actually my friend. That was the last time I got in a fight. When I was in college, when I was in college, listen, when I was in college on two different occasions playing basketball, um, I almost got in a fight with a dude. I didn't have to fight because my teammates would run to my oh, rescue yeah, and they would do it for me. I am a lover, not a fighter. But I'm going to tell you what. If I know that no matter what happens, I win, I'm going to fight differently. Like, I know that if, if, if we all got to go to war and we were told, you're going to win no matter what, I'm going to be like, let's go. Give me, give me a gun. Give me a sword. Give me nunchucks. Computer hacking skills, nunchuck skills, something. Uh, give me anything and let's go because listen, we're going to fight and we're going to go hard and no matter what happens, we win. Now, guys, listen to me. Listen to me. Do you realize that's us? You, you, listen, you realize, Christians, that we're not fighting a physical battle, a physical war. But we are in a spiritual battle and a spiritual war, and it is already decided because of Jesus that we win. So we don't go into the fight thinking, oh man, I hope we, I hope we pull this out. I hope this goes well for us. No, we know we're going to win. It's already decided. We, we win. So that should change the way that we fight. It should change the way that we go into battle.
Tonight, what I want us to do is I want us to look at the promise of our victory a little bit closer. Because here's what Paul has done. I want everybody eyeball looking at me. What Paul has done is Paul has said, you are a jar of clay. This life is going to be really, really hard. You're a jar of clay and living for Jesus is going to be really, really hard. That's why most people don't take it seriously. That's why most people play games with God and play games with church because they're not tough enough to actually fight the fight. They just, they just want to play the game. And, and most people think that they're tough by not fighting the fight for Christ. But it's really the, the men and women of God that stand up and fight the good fight of faith. They're the strong ones. Now, what I want us to do is I want us, because what Paul's going to do in chapter 5 is Paul's going to say, you're a jar of clay, you've got a lot of afflictions, things are going to be hard, that's okay, keep fighting because we win. We win. And so what he's going to do is he's going to look at that victory a little bit closer. So, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. For we know that if the tent, that is our earthly home, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on a heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened. Not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed. So that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this thing is God. Who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. First thing, listen. Notice, verse 1. We know. See that again? I love when Paul does that. Because Paul's not saying it. Paul's not saying we're guessing. Paul's not saying we think it's going to happen. Paul is saying we know. We know. This isn't wishful thinking. It is the result. Remember last week, chapter 4, verse 18? We do not look at what can be seen, but what is unseen. Right? That's called using the eyes of faith. Paul says, how do we know? Because we're not looking at things from a strictly earthly perspective. We're looking at it from a spiritual perspective. Now, what do we know? What do we know? Listen to this. I mean, sometimes I give, I give you a message and I tell you up front, this isn't going to be a really encouraging message. All right. If you don't leave here encouraged, something's wrong with you. All right. So I'm really going to make you feel good today. This is a, this is a feel good message, guys. Okay. What do we know? We know that this tent is being destroyed. Paul calls this body a tent. Now, he's also called a jar, a jar of clay, right? So this jar of clay is a tent. Now, why in the world does Paul call this body a tent? Now, in the Old Testament, Moses and the children of Israel wander in the wilderness for 40 years. While they're wandering in the wilderness, they did not have a permanent temple. Okay? That permanent temple was not built until Solomon built it a long time later. So do you know what they used as their place of worship? A portable tent. They would set up a tent. Listen, guys. They would set up a tent. And they would worship. And then God would move them. And they would take the tent all down. And they would take it someplace else. And they'd put it up again. But guess what happens to a tent? It gets worn out, doesn't it? A tent's not going to last forever. A tent will eventually get worn down. It'll get broken down and it'll get destroyed. Paul says our bodies are a tent. It's the word for tabernacle. It's a tent. It has no firm foundation. It will get worn down. Eventually, it will need to be replaced. Listen, guys. Your body needs to be replaced. It needs it. The fact that you cough or that you have allergies or that your heart gets broken is proof that this body, this life, all right, is we're, a t we're in a tent and it gets worn down and it needs to be replaced. 
And so that's exactly what Paul is going to say. Paul is relating our body to a tent, but he's saying that there is something else coming. Look at this. We know that our tent, our earthly home, is destroyed. We have a building from God. Notice the difference. Tent, building. Right? One is permanent. One has a foundation. One is fixed and one is secure. One isn't. If a tornado comes, guess what you don't want to be in? A tent. You're dead. You want to be in a building that is secure and that is fixed. And that is exactly what God is preparing for you, Christian. God is going to give your body. He's going to replace this body that you're in. He is going to fix this body. He's going to give you a new body. And that new body will be perfect. That's why the Bible says there will be in heaven, there will be no weeping. All our tears will be wiped away. There will be no sickness. There will be no death. Why? Because our bodies get remade. We get a fixed, firm foundation body. Why is it fixed? Because it's eternal. Right? Tent. Does a tent get worn down? Of course. But our building, okay, our, our new building that we're going to get, it's eternal. It's eternal. It never wears down. Now, have you guys ever tried to think of eternity? Have you ever tried to do that? Yeah. I, 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 I try to do this every once in a while. I like to sit and I like to think about what it is that something never ends. And you get the brain freeze without the ice cream. That's what ends up happening. Like you're sitting there and you're like, and no, you're like, okay, a million years. We still exist. Okay, 10 million. And at some point you go, duh. Like it's just, you, you can't fathom, right? Because all we know is beginning and end. Why? Because we're intent. And because we're in a tent, that's all we know is beginning and end. But God says there's going to come a day where you're going to get a new body, Christian. And when you get that new body, it's eternal. There is no end to it. Second thing, when you look around at the world today, you know what one thing is that nobody wants to do? Die. Nobody wants to die. Who, who wants? Nobody wants to die. Listen, we, America, we spend billions of dollars, listen to me, billions of dollars on plastic surgery every year to try to stay young. H have you seen some of our movie stars, guys? When they get so addicted, when they get so addicted to plastic surgery that they end up not looking like a human being? Like, have you seen that? It's like, they're like, okay, so all I want is my lips just to be a little fuller. And by the time it's done, they're like, I mean, it's, and you look at them and you're like, you, you're, you can't move your face. And the reason why they do that is because they're obsessed with not getting old. They're obsessed with staying young and trying never to die. They cling to life. They view death with horror. They believe that this life ought to be burden free and easy. But Christians, on the other hand, are a part of a new creation. We groan for something to change. We groan for death to be done away with so that we can live forever. As long as we're in this body, we're in a kind of exile. We're in a kind of separation from something that, from our homeland, something that we really want. In a sense, this life is a burden. Look at me. I, I want you to listen to me very carefully. I want you to listen to me very carefully. If you don't think this life is a burden, then you're not living for Jesus. Listen to me. I'm being real with you. If this life is not a burden, you are not living for Jesus. Because if you live for Jesus, you're going to have affliction in your life. So if you're coasting along in life and everything's easy and then you're not burdened, listen, then you're not living for Christ. Because in a sense, Christians look at this life and we groan for something else. We say, wait a minute, there's got to be something more than this. My, my, my wife's best friend is going to have to be put on an LVAD machine to make her heart work. We are praying that she gets a heart transplant, but she's not a great 
candidate for it. But we're praying that God will do that. And the whole time that we're going through with this, there, there's a groaning in all of us that's saying, this isn't the way it's supposed to be. This isn't the way it's supposed to be. We want something more than this. Because we realize that this life is full of suffering and sin and death, and we long for more. Not that this life cannot be blessed because of Christ. Of course it can. But we want something <laughs> more. Now, when it says naked, look back. Look back at it on, in verse um, 2 or verse 3. Indeed, by putting it on, we may not be found naked. Here's what this is probably a reference to. When you die, Christian, I want to talk about Christians because if you're not a Christian, none of the, what we're talking about that tonight applies to you. You're going to die and you're immediately going to suffer. In, in, uh, you're going to suffer. Death is going to lead immediately to suffering, not paradise. But Christians, listen to me. When you die, your soul, your spirit goes immediately to where Jesus is. Your body goes in the ground, right? But your, your spirit, your soul goes to paradise with Jesus immediately. Follow me here. Follow me. Hang on. You do not get your heavenly body then. You do not get your resurrected body then. You are, in a sense, naked. Right? You do not have a body which houses your spirit. Your spirit is with the Lord, but you still do not have it. You are unclothed. Okay? With a physical body. What Paul is saying is this. Paul is saying, we have been guaranteed that our new body will be given to us so that we won't be naked and without a, head, without a body forever. We're only going to be away from the body for a little bit. Just, just for a little bit. That's just a side note. We won't spend a whole lot of time on that. Next, a mortal life swallowed up. Let me tell you something. There's a woman. Her name is Joni Erickson Tata. She is a... Uh, I believe she's a, she a quadriplegic. So she has no use of her hands or her legs. Um, she has suffered mightily. She got it when she was a little girl, right? She, she dived into a pool and hit her head and yeah, a teenager and, and broke her neck and she is paralyzed from the neck now. Somebody asked her one day, why do you think God has let this happen to you? You know what her answer was? She said, I have suffered so much on this earth, it makes me just long for something more. The more we suffer, the more we long. The more we groan. The more we want something more. See, if everything's easy and you're coasting, then there's not that burden for something. I want something more. God, fix this. Please, oh God, fix this. Well, if you don't suffer real hard, you don't have that desire. Joni Erickson Tata said, I have that desire. Paul says it like this, the mortal may be swallowed up in life. He says it this way in 1 Corinthians 15, 54, <laughs> death has swallowed, has been swallowed up in victory. The point he is making is this, Christians, those of you that are in Christ, the new creation of the kingdom of God is now warring against sin. We are in this battle, we are in this war, and we are going to be rewarded with a perfect body and a perfect life and a perfect victory. It is like, listen, think about it this way. Here's, here's the visual image I got. So you got a jar of clay. Inside that jar of clay is put Jesus, the treasure, right? In, we put inside of us. And at some point, the inside of us is going to begin to reverberate inside. It's going to begin to move. And all of a sudden, it from the inside is going to come out and it's going to swallow up everything that you are. And when that happens, your new life begins. Your new body is given to you. The life of Christ will swallow up this life. The life of Christ inside of us will burst forth and swallow up the jar of clay. This we know. We do not wish that it will happen. We know that it will happen. So what, listen to me, whatever life throws at you, whatever hardship comes your way, whatever struggle you have, realize I am in Christ and the life of Christ will one day swallow all this up. 
And when he swallows it up, it's going to be victory, perfect victory forever. Now, look at this. This is what I love about God. God encourages us, and then when he's done encouraging us, you know what he does? He just encourages us again. And then after he's done encouraging us again, you know what he does? He just encourages us again. It's like over and over and over God encourages us. So he's already, listen, that's already encouragement. No matter what I'm going through, no matter how hard the Bible is, by the Bible, no matter how hard life is, the Bible tells me that, that the life of Christ is going to swallow up death. It's going to swallow everything up and I'm going to have victory. This mortal life is going to be swallowed up. And then he says this. Because he knows that we're going to doubt. He knows that when hardships come, we're going to doubt. So he's just going to continue to encourage us. He says this in verse 5. That all of this is from God. Listen to me. It's from God. Why can I have confidence that this is going to happen? Because God's doing it. Let me tell you something. I don't put any confidence in myself. I am a moron. <laughs> and so are you. Listen to me. You are. You do stupid thing after stupid thing. And God tells you to believe. He encourages you. And guess what? You doubt. And you struggle. And you doubt and you struggle. And then you doubt some more and then you struggle. And then you get a little victory and you get a little success. And then you doubt some more. And then you sin and you fall and you mess up. And if I had to put confidence that all this stuff was going to happen because of me, we're doomed. Like, I'm done with, guys. And so are you. And that's why Paul says, hey, guys, this ain't going to happen because of you. This is going to happen because of God. God's doing this, not you. God is doing this. In the original language, the word God has all the emphasis, meaning that Paul wants us to know it's all God's work, not ours. This means it's grace working and not you. Let me ask you a question. Can God try to do something and fail to get it done? Can God ever try to do something and then fail at it? No. What kind of God is that? Well, today, I'm gonna try, I don't know why I went to country voice. I immediately went to country voice. Well, today, we're gonna try to get this done. I hope, I hope we can finish it. And that, that's what, that, but sometimes I think that's how we view God. Like God's gonna try to do something today, and if I help him out, we might get it done. Paul's saying nonsense here. That's nonsense. You know why you're gonna get a heavenly body? You know why death is gonna get destroyed by life? Because of God, not because of you. Again, what confidence. What, what wonderful encouragement. <laughs> and let me encourage you again. Verse 5. We not only have the plan and purpose of God from all eternity to give us a glorified body. We also have the spirit of God that's been put inside of us. Christian, listen to this. The moment you got saved, the spirit of God came and lived inside of you. Did you know that? The moment you got saved, the Spirit of God came and lived inside of you. Paul says, look at verse 5. He who has prepared us for this is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. The word guarantee, guys, is the word down payment. You, you guys know what a down payment is? Y'all probably haven't had to do it yet. But let me tell you what's going to happen in your life at some point. How many of you want to own a car one day? A Lambo. Right, a Lambo. I'm with you, dude. I like it. Dream big to go home. That's what I said. Listen, we all want to own a car one day. If you are going to buy a car, do you know what's a, probably a good idea for you to do? Is to put a down payment on that car. Here's what a down payment is. You take a... a, 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 a take some money and you go to your vendor that's selling you the car and you say I want to put $2,000 down on my car. What you're doing is you're saying here's my down payment, here's my promise, here's the guarantee that I'm going to pay off the rest of the car because I'm not going to waste my $3,000, $2,000, you know what I'm saying? So I'm going to go in there and I'm going to say here's my $2,000 bucks, 
I'm putting it down as a down payment. That's a guarantee that ultimately I'm going to pay the whole thing off. Right? right? Now, listen to this. Paul says that God gives the Holy Spirit as a what? A down payment. For what? The resurrection. So check this out. Listen, listen, look at me. Here it is. God says, my child, I love you and I'm saving you and I'm taking my Holy Spirit as a down payment and I'm giving you my Holy Spirit because I'm guaranteeing you by giving you my Holy Spirit that I'm going to finish the deal by raising you up. So here's my Holy Spirit as a down payment. And because I got the Holy Spirit, I'm going to finish the deal. Why? Because that's what God has promised. When God gives us the Holy Spirit, he is giving us a down payment. The Spirit is a guarantee. So here it is, guys. Look. Here it is. We got a tent. This tent is wearing down. This tent will eventually get out. It needs to be replaced. God says, I'm going to replace it. The life of Christ is going to swallow up death. It's going to swallow up the mortal. It's going to swallow up the tent and the temporary. And it's going to swallow it up. You're going to have a permanent body, a permanent foundation that's fixed forever and ever and ever. That's what's going to happen. And listen to me. Listen. God's doing this. And God has given you a down payment or a promise or a guarantee that he's going to finish the deal. Now, Christian, look at me. Christian, look at me. You're in a war. You're in a battle. And God has promised you that you're going to win. Christian, you win. No matter how hard things get, no matter how bad things are, you win. That is why Christians will die rather than, than abandon Christ. Is because they know you can cut my head off. You can burn me alive. You can feed me to the lions. You can crucify me on a cross upside down. You can run me through with the pole. You can dip me in oil and light me on fire. I will not abandon Christ because no matter what you do to me, I win. I come back to life. No matter what, we win. We just got to believe that. We just got to live like that is true because if we believe that, it will change the way that we fight the battle. Just like if you were in a real war, look at me. Just like if you were in a real war and somebody said, no matter what, you can't lose. Man, you're going to go fly into battle. You're getting after it because you know you're going to win. Christians, we win, so let's get after it. No matter what happens, it's all right. We win. It's going to be okay. We win. So be encouraged today. You win. God's doing it. He's giving the Holy Spirit. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy. It just means no matter what happens, we win. All right?